to be here. It's a pleasure to be back up here. As Keith Richards says, it's a pleasure to be anywhere. So, it's a so small talk and reflection. Is reflection really small talk's most enduring idea? Because you know, small talk's influence is pervasive, and I think as we all know, it goes way beyond the language itself in all kinds of dimensions. So, it, the, the title's a little provocative. You know, reflection, I say, is small talk's most enduring idea. I mean, what about virtual machine architecture or windowed user interfaces or point-and-click GUIs or dynamic languages or reflection, yeah, I mean, refactoring, automated testing, patterns, or even the entire idea of object-oriented languages themselves. So this may be a debatable topic, hence the cowardly hedge and the question mark up there on the slide. But I think it's a makeable case, and uh, if you indulge me, uh, that's what I'm going to try and do for the next hour or so. I'm going to try and make it. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a Franken talk, which is uh, you know, kind of the, the style I have adopted as of late, because I've got a lot of material in the attic, especially on reflection. So this is going to be in four parts, drawn from material from four decades worth of work, not quite in chronological order. And, um, the first section is going to start way back during the Reagan administration in uh, Urbana, Illinois, back in 1985. This is uh, in a house I still own today. This is uh, the room in which I learned small talk. You know, I, I think I um, already went through a fair bit of my life story yesterday, so I don't have to repeat that all today. But uh, you know, you'll recall the spaghetti and the frameworks and the reuse and the patterns. So. Talked about NCC 81, going back to school, meeting the great Dr. Johnson, getting into small talk. And you know, remember I was building a framework for a faux lab application, um, which was the focus of my MS, which um, Ali just mentioned. It was called uh, Designing to Facilitate Change with Object-Oriented Frameworks. I think it was the, uh, the largest MS that the CS department had ever produced, and one of the first ones the, for which the manuscript was actually fully computer generated because I had WYSIWYG stuff as a result of having all those cool computers at home. You know, this was really unusual during those days. The one on the left is a PCXT, which to the best of my knowledge would still work if I started it up. And then you've got the Mac Plus, which was probably not running uh, Smalltalk at the moment, and the Lisa, which was also capable of doing likewise. Um, so, you know, as, as I've uh, confided to you already, among the most beguiling, appealing things about small talk was that uh, you not only had a GUI where you could surf the code, but you could change it too. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that before. I don't think any of us, you know, outside some of the research labs had ever seen anything about it. And you had all the code. And moreover, it was objects all the way down. And they were there too. You could get your hands on. It was, as I think some of uh, you who went through that uh, similar experience during that period confided, 
it's the coolest thing you ever saw. It, it really was beguiling. You just dive deep into it, you want to explore it. I was totally hooked. So, you know, along with the frameworks, um, you know, we were embarking on a little bit of an adventure in those days. And um, so we looked at, you know, some of the objects that Smalltalk was already built out of and started to ask ourselves the questions, you know, what else might we be able to do? You know, where do these end? So we started out, you know, testing, researching, tinkering, and exploring the limits of how you could extend and enhance the objects that uh, you found in that uh, you know, massive repository of um, source code, particularly the ones in the kernel, the ones that the object, that, that the uh, language was built out of. I mean, this idea that you had a language built out of objects and you could change them, that was just, you know, just incredibly beguiling. So we started doing, you know, does, under, does not understand tricks and variations on those. We built things like objects that if you didn't have a particular instance variable would you know, go to a method, you know, go to a dictionary, pretend they had the variable and respond to all the corresponding accessors. Then the other way around, you know, if you had um, what were basically properties, they were properties, and you access them as if they were instance variable accessor methods, it would go ahead and do the translation as well. All that kind of stuff. And you know, what was cool about that wasn't that there was anything profound about building that. Once you had that facility, you could. It was that you could do it at all. It, said it was possible if you decided you wanted something to work that way to build the objects out of which you know, those components of the language were built and be able to change them. It was just you know, more fun than might have been good for a person at the time. So we had uh, does not understand, and you know, we do that these days, but we, we needed a little bit more. I actually figured out how to patch the 68,000 binaries for the Apple VM to enable this, these meta object objects, which are, you know, they're like, you know, meta classes, except you attach them to a particular object, and, uh, you know, it's a one to one correspondence between the instance and the behavior object that you tack on to the individual instance, which was something that was not quite easy to do in small talk then and had been talked about in the literature. And uh, we kind of needed that uh, VM hack. We downplayed that in uh, reflective facilities in small talk 80, which was first conference paper I'd ever gotten accepted. That was um, presented at Uppsala uh, 1989, uh, first time I got to, uh, admit, got the Uppsala bug in 1986, sent myself to the first one managed to attend all of them all the way through 2012. It was a wonderful community, they're great folks, you know. Miss seeing them every year, you know, those of them that are still around, most of them are. But in any case, this paper um, and some of the material in my um, master's thesis contain the source code for some of these little experiments with uh, meta objects, and uh, you can still find them. In fact, if I wrote it, you can find it. It's, uh, yeah, everything's easy to find these days, but um, back about, oh, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, I got myself a domain and started putting all my stuff out on the internet, and it's still all there. It's uh, real retro looking. The site's called Laputin.org, but you know, use the force, as I always say. Use Google. You, know, you don't really need pointers to anything anymore. The Oracle at Mountain View will find them for you, so no problem. So, you know, we went ma manic on thinking about what you could do to, um, you know, explore the space of cool things that you could build on top of small talk if you felt like it. And so, you know, I had this list I made of, you know, here, here we go, there's 40 things that you might have built, you know, we've got things like atomic objects, and we thought about everything, you know, could you build multiple inheritance? Sure, yeah, if you had the right stuff, you know, could you make smart pointers? Some of these things, though, kind of push the limits of what it might be possible to do with then and now uh, most of the small talk VMs. And so we started realizing we were going down a path towards figuring out where the limitations of all the cool stuff that you could build um, on top of this language actually were and where we might need some additional facilities and you know, VMs or primitives or in architecture in order to, to get more of these. Um, you know, lots of fun stuff. You know, list goes on. You know, it's actually, um, let's see here. Yes, there's uh, 
actually a second page. And I, I think the list got up to what was it, 78? I don't really remember. Now, apologies to American playwright Tennessee Williams. The name Glass Menagerie is a uh, pun on his play, Glass Menagerie, and uh, the Blue Roses. Well, if you've ever seen the play, you know where that came from. It's, uh, I used to enjoy that kind of arcane humor. Um, I've now realized that the audience for it is very sparse. Uh, but we started to see where the barriers were when we started thinking about what it might take to build some of these things. And it would have been cool to build some of those things, and we did build some of those things, but we realized, you know, I had an MS already. You know, you weren't going to get, you know, you, they wouldn't give you a doctorate for building 78 cool things out of objects in small talk, as much fun as that might have been. Um, what we had to do is explore what the barriers were, both in designing a curl of the language and what it was you couldn't do um, directly in, in small talk. And there were basically four areas, and these were discussed all the way back in that 1989 paper. You, you can't really hijack sends. I mean, does not understand isn't quite what you were looking for. You can't really intervene as a message is received. You know, you can't screen your messages uh, um, all that easily. Uh, variable access, for some strange reason, um, wasn't something that you could wrap. And um, returns, be they local or non-local, were things you couldn't get your hands on either. And there were reasons you could come up with for wanting to do any of those things. So. Um, likewise, you know, what you wanted to be able to do is tell a story about dispatch that involved maybe a polite fiction about some things that were happening um, that would require you to perhaps, but not regularly, get your hands on objects that may or may not be part of the architecture. So, you know, you'd want to figure out um, how we were you know, dealing with references, identity, things like identifying the receivers, queuing messages, unqueuing messages, doing the lookup, actually making the behavior go. And, uh, you know, we experimented with different variations on this with different flavors. So I'm, I'm not really going total detail of the alternatives we looked at for doing this. But, but the upshot was you needed to define a set of objects and then think about you know, what the architecture of them would have to be and what they would have to do you know, in order to fully enable access to all these things. The other thing you needed to do was to figure out whether or not you could use any of the brilliant kind of techniques that you saw in Peter Deutsch's wonderful virtual machines for making things appear if they weren't there, which uh, we subsequently came to learn was an embodiment of an idea called reification. So, um, let's see, was I a slide ahead there? Yeah, I may have been, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, this was the slide I was supposed to be looking at. So, we became aware in 1987 at the second Oops, I met a guy named Danny Bobrow from Park, we started hanging around with some of the Park people that there was one other current, you know, which had also come out of Park, interestingly enough, um, in this stream of people that were exploring building languages out of objects. And it, in, in some ways, it was, you know, they were not quite the purists that the, um, the small talk people were, because Common Lisp, where the Common uh, Lisp object system was built, and the Meta Object Protocol built on the Common Lisp object system, were in fact built upon Common Lisp, which was not an object-oriented language. But they had a range of great ideas about how to build their object system on top of Lisp and then how to make the object system let you get your hands on as much as possible. So they basically had that same goal. So a community was starting to form when people from the small talk planet and people from the sea loss planet would start talking to each other and figuring out and start comparing notes about which of these sets of objects are the coolest objects for building um, you know, other object-oriented facilities on top of, you know, basically building languages out of objects. And um, we then suddenly came to learn that there was a name that had been bandied around more in the sea loss community uh, than uh, in the small talk community, and that you know, brought other research to the table, this is idea of reflection. Now, it's too bad Theo can't be here today to see his uh, student, Patty Mays, being illustrated on this slide. I used to joke, this is the woman who ruined my life. You know, she was uh, a star doing reflection research, you know, got me dragged into this you know, reflection thing for, what is it, the next 35 or 40 years, you know. Um, 
famous for having been named one of People Magazine's most beautiful people in 1989, I think it was. You know, she subsequently got her uh, PhD doing a, a language called um, it's a 3KRS, uh, which was built on something called 3Lisp, which came from another really bright guy who had uh, been at uh, Park, Brian Cantwell Smith. And it was those folks that had defined this idea of reflection and set certain parameters for it. And in some ways, they were they were a bit more theoretical. You know, it, it's the, the, the three of people were concerned with building a tower of things on top of things whereby, you know, if you had the need to look into yourself, you could perhaps lazily create another layer of the language on top of it and then figure out what the mechanism for having the changes made to one re uh, reflect into the other. And that was, the, that was where reflection came from. You know, the idea was you had a causally connected, you know, description of the underlying language we're running on um, yourself at the time. So, you know, people that are familiar with debugging and, uh, you know, real-time stuff, in some ways I think it, um, getting debugging right is blue-collar reflection. What you're really trying to do is get your hands on a representation of the actual running thing, your actual beating heart, where if you change that representation, you, the idea of causal connection is that one way or another, and we may not tell you how, um, the changes get reflected into the actual running stuff. So, for our part, we realized, you know, they had their towers, but when you looked at small talk, there were really three different ways of, you know, making the appearance of objects all the way down be true. One would be induction, where you say, all right, I've got an object and it's built on top of another object, but eventually you get to a primitive. Eventually it bottoms out. So that's like mathematical induction, right? You just own up to the fact that sooner or later you get to something that maybe isn't an object anymore, or that isn't pretending to be an object. The second is um, circularity for dealing with regress. That's what you know. That's basically what they do up in the meta object, uh, or the meta class protocol. You, sooner or later, you can see a loop. You know, something is maybe I item potent is a term you would use. You know, sooner or later, if you're asking for the something of something, you just keep getting the same thing back, and that's okay if it's structural. But the third trick, and the thing that, uh, you know, Peter Deutsch did so cleverly and that the small talk people did so well was this idea of, of lazy reification. You know, if, if I have this model, and this is what I was talking before, uh, about before with dispatch, and I want to, you know, have this object appear, you cheat but don't get caught. You do not make the concrete object-oriented first-class embodiment appear until you need it, and then you lazily create it. And you know, the poster child for that was contexts. If you ask for a context, it kind of appears out from the, you know, the, the um, you know, murky innards of the virtual machine and becomes this real object you can start stomping on, and then you can build a debugger. So this is where we were with this basically by the end of the 80s. And research continued. This will get me to um, part two. I'll alleviate some of that stickiness in my voice here. So this is a um, this was an attempt, a successful one, I might add, to um, have the courage of our convictions and build you know objects on top of small talk that allowed us to demonstrate that some of these cool facilities other languages have, if you had the right set of objects, could be built in a language like Smalltalk. You know, it's, uh, I used to bandy around terms like, you know, architectural balkanization in the post-linguistic era. I mean, the, the cool thing about building languages out of objects is you don't need new languages if the language you got lets you put the stuff in it that you don't have. And I still think that's a wonderful a wonderful idea, and I still think there's um, you know, room for improvement in the way we did it. In fact, you know, I hope to uh, leave that as an exercise for you and the rest of the community. But um, this work on uh, trying to bring C loss, you know, multi methods um, into in, into Smalltalk finally got presented at eCoop 2005. And uh, that year, eCoop 2005 was in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Now, you may not be able to tell, you know, not being native English speakers, that, you know, despite my spy, uh, spot on Chicago accent, I'm actually a native of uh, Northern Ireland, 
which happened to be about 130 miles from Glasgow, Scotland. So, you know, it, it may seem strange that I'm mentioning this, but indulge me because it will, you know, matter as this, this talk progress, progresses here. Um, I had the privilege of working to, with two native speakers on uh, that uh, paper as well. Ralph Johnson was on it, as was uh, James Noble, an Englishman and a Kiwi. Um, so, what I discovered was, you know, academics are novelty vampires, they crave new stuff. You know, th this work was uh, unusual and it was a culmination of stuff that had been done several years before. Um, so, you know, I guess the program committee must have thought there was something of enduring value in it. Um, but one of the things we discovered when we workshopped this paper in the uh, software architecture group was there were a lot of people, you know, after uh, several years of Java who did not know the difference between um, dynamic multi-way dispatch and static overloading. Uh, you know, about half the people in the room, and these were all graduate students in computer science, and so I realized if that was true of an audience at the University of Illinois, it was likely true of an eCoop audience. So we decided at the beginning of the talk to motivate um, the talk by explaining what the difference actually was. And uh, you know, we did it by coming up with a pretext for finding something that was going to require four-way dispatch. And you know, given where I was and given that you know, I thought I would have a little fun with this, uh, we basically put together a pretext where, you know, an Irishman and a Scotsman are drinking their two ancestral beverages and have different reactions, because there are going to be four different reactions. And Martin, my apologies, but you know how the Irish and Scots are, so it's not... So, you know, here's the motivation, you know, it's... Um, consider a simple Scotsman, he's a subclass of carouser who likes to go out and uh, drink libations of various sorts and uh, implements a simple operation in vibe, which takes a libation as an argument. In order for the model to exhibit the degree of real-world fidelity the problem demands, we need to find a way that ensure our Scotsman's behavior is distinguished by the kind of libation that he imbibes. So the first attempt, when the Caledonian carouser, that's to say the Scotsman, uh, savors his dram of scotch, he adds the arguments of the contents to his stomach, cranks up his blood alcohol level a wee notch, and utters something incomprehensible that evidently nonetheless indicates profound satisfaction. Because if you've ever been to Scotland and you're even a native speaker, speaker of English, you know that they can be difficult to understand. However, when Angus the Scotsman uh, samples the Irish whiskey, he adds the contents to his stomach. It would seem he has no discernible effect on his blood alcohol level and he mutters disgust. Now, the only thing that's significant about this is you know, two different reactions to two different libations. Whereas um, the Irishman, his reaction to scotch is to em empty the contents of his stomach in deference to the audience's sensibilities, the detailed implementation is not shown. Uh, he is soothed and satisfied uh, by his response to his native spirits, which of course are like that uh, of a babe to mother's milk, save for his effect on his blood alcohol level. So. A simple test of the code. We create an Irishman patty and a Scotsman Angus and press them into service, imbibing each of the libations. Um, now, you can run this program, and rest assured we did. Um, one should uh, never display code in the presentation. It's never been run, and it does produce the expected out outcome. However, there's a problem with the uh, previous example. It may even strike some as quite subtle the first time they think about it. Let's not Let's try to invo invoke our imbibe operation in the context where the type of the operands cannot be deter statically determined. In fact, this code will not run. You Java people probably know that. It will not even compile. This is because, well, the first oper operand to imbibe the receiver is the carouser, is dispatched using runtime polymorphism. The second one, the libation, is resolved using static overloading, which is a horse of an entirely different color. The implant implementations we've seen here are um, really nothing but name-mangled single dispatch under the hood, really, if you look at the code. So you could do a useless overload. Um, the only thing operator overloading has in common with real object-oriented programming is the double O's. Um, we, we can get the previous 
example to compile by adding this method, but this doesn't enable us to realize the desired result. It results instead in this useless method being called every time the carouser imbibes a libation. So what do you do? Now, you could argue that this is at least a foothold. If we change the implementation of imbibe in carouser to explicitly test and dispatch according to its second argument using a type case, we can achieve the desired result. But writing type cases kind of defeats the purposes, because type cases are, in my mind at least, a code smell. Remember Kent Beck from, I think, both my previous talks. Um, the notion of code smell is vivid, compelling, immediate, and ingenious. You know, it's Beck channeling Marcel Proust. And uh, my friend's type cases are among the most disgusting of uh, code rot. So what do we do instead? Now, the customary solution in singly dispatched languages to this problem is to employ an idiom known as double dispatching. Multiple dispatch was first described in the classic Uppsala 86 paper by master coder Dan Ingalls. Uh, Kurt Hebel and Ralph Johnson produced a nice readable treatment of double dispatch about 12 years ago, at least at that time. That's probably 22 years ago now. So what happens is, when the Irishman imbibes a dram, he can't be sure exactly what's in it, but he knows for sure it's been drunk by an Irishman. So he dutifully informs the libation of this fact. So you're kind of ricocheting over the other uh, argument. By virtue of the second method invocation, true polymorphism is brought into play a second time. And sure, in Bigara, the Irishman may not, know, may not be sure what he drank, but a dram of Irish whiskey knows just what to do in an Irishman's stomach, and you've solved the problem. So, of course, using double dispatch requires that you implement these ricochet, pinball, bumper kind of routines. And in general, the number which must be implemented is potentially, but seldom actually, quite large. And we'll see that later in the um, presentation. So, wouldn't it be nice if we could specify that more than one argument to a method can participate fully in the dispatch process? Here's how that might look or it might have looked in Java. Um, someone evidently decided that what Java really needed to relieve the onerous, evidently unbearable burden of writing um, an explicit down case for iterator assignments was a fully blown parametric uh, type system. Java now has lots of type systems. Um, long story there, I'm not gonna ruminate over it. But there are languages with syntax for um, multi-method dispatch. Here are three examples. And um, here's the example that we chose for small talk. Um, our class specializers are enclosed in brackets. The VisualWorks small talk compiler at that time had a uh, dormant postfix bracketed type recognition uh, facility built into it. Um, we simply turned that on, overwrote a few methods uh, to wire in our multi-method facilities, an Easter egg in the compiler, I guess it was. So, Asymmetric multi-methods are preferentially attached or owned by their primary receiver. Symmetric multi-methods, like generic uh, functions in um, CLOS, are owned by none. So depending, you can think about it either way. Um, as the faux job example shows, our code is an asymmetric design. Our goal was to present um, symmetric syntax, as CLOS had done, well, maintaining, at least for the time being, asymmetric uh, aspirations. So um, here's what the browser looked like. You know, the tooling actually took more time than the implementation. It always does. Um, so here are some uses of what this uh, may have looked like. Visitor, ideal, you know, for multi-methods. That simple. You don't have to look at the Goff book and understand, you know, what all the business about um, double dispatch actually might have meant. Um, before, it looks like this. After, it looks like that. Much simpler. And, uh, you know, if you want to stare at this, the paper is, of course, you know, in the, uh, on the same web page where uh, all my other stuff is. But here is what be was beautiful about all of this. Um, working with a language built out of objects, you can begin to aspire to do things like this. 
And what we did for this particular exploration was build a bunch more of them. These are the language, uh, these are the objects we built. This is in a lot of ways following the roadmap from the common, uh, you know, the common list mop and demonstrating that you can use that roadmap to build those meta objects, to build those objects on top of a, a small talk kernel with the, uh, the, the right extensions. And that was the idea. That was the thing that uh, we undertook to be able to do. Um, and yeah, I think there's a, a synergy w between those two meta object protocols. There were things that um, the MOP could do, like multi methods and overriding um, you know, access to slots, they call them in CLOP, CLOS, instance variables, that at least at the time we were doing it were, weren't really accessible to us um, in, in, in Smalltalk, and, and, and vice versa. So I'll let that one go, and that one as well. There's some maps. So now let's talk about some of the uh, implementation issues with this. Um, one of the um, method combination objects generalizes the notion of uh, double dispatch to an arbitrary num uh, number of arguments. There was another one, um, another Easter egg in the compiler that lets you use dot dotted method selector syntax to distinguish um, the you know, generated pinball wizard kind of multi-dispatch uh, methods from, from regular ones. So one of the ways you could implement this is to just you know, employ the fact that you've got a small talk compiler right there you know, available to you. You can compile methods at runtime and generate all the dispatch methods. And um, you know, any idiot can plainly see that this formula is trivially self-explanatory. This is the number of methods you would have to generate for anyway multi-dispatch with certain numbers of specializations on each of the arguments. I always wanted to say that at a computer conference because anytime people put an equation up, they always say something like, any fool can comprehend immediately that this is true. It is, it is not easy to read this equation. You know, this is, um, so let me be precise for, what, for once in my life. You know, the, the formula above gives the cardinality of the set of generated redispatch re methods, bar D, given a generic function with a set of specialized parameters, S1 through Sn, the cardinality of each of which is indicated by bar S sub bar J. Uh, the, the lower expansion gives you a little better idea what has to happen. We, we checked it out. This is actually true. This is what you have to do. And you can actually juggle the order around if you want to shorten it. It's an interesting, interesting issue. But the stuff that was more fun was figuring out from among a variety of specialized implementations um, which ones performed the best. And um, there were different things you could do. You could uh, do brute force objects that use a lot of uh, does not understands, which wound up being really slow. Um, you could use caching tricks so that if you'd done a lookup look before, you could get the time down. You could use hashing tricks whereby you hash the um, identities of the specializers and try to shorten the lookup that way, which worked quite well. And then finally, you can do the multi-dispatch, which is taking advantage of the VM's real capacity for doing real dispatch and win fairly big. Um, down toward the bottom, the time for doing multi-way uh, dispatch as you know, a ratio of what it would take to do a single, single dispatch was starting to look really good. And this is before we had any VMs to hack. So and we never really did get to the point of doing um, VM hacking. But as an illustration of building the objects, you know, mostly capable of being implemented on top of the kernel, this was fairly elaborate, pretty cool. So, you know, what lessons that we learned, you know, just the beauty of building a language out of objects. I'm still floored by that. Um, I got to you know, do a shout out to the elegance of the mop design. Um, the, the idea that uh, building languages out of objects is cool, and um, just a, a glimpse of what it would be like to have uh, multi methods in, in your language. They've become a bit more common these days. Um, they weren't all that common back in those days. And, uh, I'd like to see them in more languages. Okay, so now let me flash forward. Um, and uh, engage in a somewhat more general discussion of this idea of metadata. Um, metadata and reflection wound up being two so sides of the same coin. I mean, when people would talk about being able to have introspective facilities in a language, that was going to be about metadata. 
And when they would talk about being able to change things, people would call that interceding rather than introspecting, or they would say that part was the actual reflection. But metadata has become an exceedingly important uh, idea. Uh, and you know, the, this section of the talk I want to talk about um, as one of the two primary sources through which you know, this idea of reflection and metadata became popular in the programming language community. Its enduring importance, I think, in some ways has resulted from the research that uh, you know, people did on this during the 80s and 90s. So, you know, the uh, Catholics have their trinity, the Hindus have their trinity, comedy has its trinity, you know, it's, uh, object-oriented people have this one. Um, Inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. I used to remember it with P-I-E, the English word for that yummy dessert on, on the right-hand side of the screen. But it leads us to this, the distinction between data and metadata. I mean, data are things that describe or characterize some aspect of a domain quantitatively or quality, uh, qualitatively. They're about something, you know, that, that isn't necessarily in a computer, but the data often will be. We're, we're living in the big data age now, as you all know. I mean, I, I imagine, you know, like, like me, a lot of you have been dragged into the big data planet. That's what I do at uh, my day job these days. So data are more important than ever. But if you don't know what data mean, they're kind of useless. Um, you know, if it's just ones and zeros, what the heck is the point? So what are metadata? Metadata are data too. They just happen to describe a particular kind of thing. You know, rather than arbitrarily you know, anything, like your age or height, metadata describe other data. They let a computer know what data mean. They describe some aspect of a domain, qualitatively or quantitatively. And um, a few years back, we started to say, well, you know, what kind of flavors of metadata are there? And uh, identified a trinity for it. There's um, markup, manifest, and meta objects. So the markup style of metadata is where you embed the knowledge of, of what the data mean in the data themselves, along with them. You know, it's uh, probably the best example is uh, something like XML. Um, in which you know, these tags are being embedded with the things that are being described so that you kind of know what they are. Uh, another good example of that is uh, annotations. Um, annotations in, say, Java code are things that uh, stick with the data. They're kind of wrapped in with, you know, the, the program's data, the program's a bunch of text, and um, the things that are describing what the program segment is about, the annotations, are wrapped in with the actual program itself, even though they're often processed by different processors or processed in a different way. When I see the word JSON, I always think of this guy. You know, I think a lot of you probably do. But you know, JSON's another example of um, a, a style data presentation in which you embed the descriptions, like the names, along with the actual values. Now, there's a second school of thought about how to organize uh, metadata. And that's to have a manifest. You know, think about the Rosetta Stone, something of like that. You've got your data, but you've also got a separate description, which lets you or a program read, map, or uh, interpret the data. You know, the, the manifest, in, in some ways, is like a different language. You know, it can be a different language or notational style from the information that it maps. Like, for instance, DTDs. I've always wondered why they had two languages for this. You had a, a DTD that described XML that looked nothing like XML all that much. You know, had things that weren't really legal and legal XML. You know, why did they introduce a second language? I don't know. You know it's, uh... Anyway, I found myself interested in metadata because they were a solution to a problem that I had. Remember my spaghetti code story where in order to keep from going insane and having to maintain 15 copies of the same spaghetti code, what I tried to do was parameterize some of these applications so that they could run lots and lots of these different uh, programs just by pushing the configuration out onto the users. That was my favorite trick. You know, it's, if I could push the configuration out onto the users, they wouldn't come to me and say, could we change our program in order to be able to allow there to be 300 subjects instead of 200 subjects? And I said, nah, you got a parameter for that. Do it yourself. You know, it's great. You'd be all done. Um, That's a little quip. Um, 
Let's see, where are we with this? One of these is true. The, the term meta gets bandied around a lot. Um, and I contend that one of these statements is accurate and that uh, you know, one of them isn't. Um, I don't think meta is harmful. I think it's a wonderful idea. And uh, I think it's, it, it's become essential to allowing our programs to play well with others. I mean, if you're bringing in data from an outside source, somehow being able to know what the data are about, and moreover, having the potential to be able to consume that at runtime is an important thing to be able to do. So meta, definitely not harmful. However, the meta prefix gets overused. I think people lazily use it in places where you can you know, scratch out the word meta and put in a word that's more descriptive that nonetheless you know, conveys that it's describing something that is obviously data and uh, you'd be better off. Down. So what's good about metadata? Well, they facilitate tool construction. You know, they let you build GUIs. They let you automate stuff. Um, they come in three flavors. We had markup and manifest, and we'd already looked at meta objects. I mean, the more elaborate um, flavor of uh, metadata is if you've got objects, you have another object that describes the object. You know, that, that in a way, if it's not just a mere map, is, is a meta object, it has behavior. Uh, metadata make it possible for frameworks to f fulfill their own, their full potential because they can start to consume things from the outside world. So the more you can make configurable, the more you can make be driven by the data, the less you have to write additional programs and uh, you know, the less often you have to figure out ways to make the programs be able to you know, comply with changing requirements. There is a problem with metadata-driven solutions. They, um, they're often arcane. They can be hard to understand. You know, the, the data can be confusing. And you know, as with everything else in the world, you know, the documentation, if it exists, can lag, and uh, the tools likewise. Um, and there's you know, the, the problem of empowering some while placing others at, at their mercy. You know, it's, um, if you don't have the full documentation, if you don't know what the, you know, a data set is about, you know, the guy who uh, does know, know that owns you. you know, it's, a, it's not a good place to be. Finally, the ugly. Um, metadata descriptions can be really hard on the eyes. It's, uh, XML, you know, in my opinion, is something that should never have had to be read by humans. I mean, I, I'm okay with XML, but there should have been better tools for writing XML. I was kind of appalled that, that build systems like Ant and uh, Maven make you actually go in there and mess with XML. You know, it's, uh, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. The tools for metadata are ad hoc, underpowered, and uh, you know, the APIs can be cumbersome, sometimes intentionally so. But the idea of being able to introspect you know, which is something that's metadata driven, and to be able to intercede, which you know, requires somewhat more elaborate reflective facilities, has been an incredible win. And you know, what it enables here is uh, things like JUnit. You know, JUnit was something where you have these test cases, the code is out there, how does the test framework know that there are tests out there? The answer is it uses reflection. It reads, you know, reads the metadata that describes the program figures out that the names have a certain characteristic and then is able to use that information to actually run code to allow you to run your, your testing framework. You know, another place where this is used is dependency injection, at least the you know, spring-like dependency injection that you know, relies upon reading the metadata from the program and actually orchestrating the whole thing um, by just looking at the code and seeing what's out there. It's kind of the uh, JUnit um, experience on steroids in a way. None of this would be possible without metadata and reflection. This, this whole system 
of allowing these components to kind of float like little pieces of ravioli out there and be lashed together by XML glue, you know, kind of the, the bucket of glue architecture, is enabled by, you know, the use of metadata that can be read by, you know, any tool that uh, is capable of ingesting them. And so that brings us to the last decade and then the last segment of the talk. This is, a, um, this is built on a um, talk that I gave at uh, Small Talk Solutions 2006. Um, some of you were there, evidently. And this, was a, um, this was a talk that I had the audacity to give this title. This was actually, um, this was that particular uh, quip, I have nothing to declare by my, uh, but my genius, was, um, was made by Oscar Wilde the first time he came to the United States. He went through customs and he was asked whether he had anything to declare. And this is what he said, because that's the kind of, kind of guy that he was. So my story about that is, you know, I, I thought, I've always thought this would be a great title for talking about dynamic languages and why I hate type systems, <laughs> you know, because this is how I feel about type systems. This is how I feel about some of the theoretical stuff that people beat us over the heads, uh, the head with, and, and, and why I like late binding as a, ph a philosophy of life. But my story about this in 2006 got more colorful because uh, I think of all the... Um, of, of all the immigration um, you know, facilities I've had to go through, the Canadians are the toughest on Americans. So when I came in for uh, Small Talk Solutions 2006, they asked me what I was there for. I mean, what they're really worried about is that I'm an American coming to take a job from a Canadian. You know, so, um, they asked me what I was doing there. I said, well, I'm going to a conference. And they go, well, what's the name of the conference? And I said, well, it's... Uh, it's over at the Rogers Center, and thereabouts, it's called, you know, Small Talk Solutions 2006. And he said, what are you doing there? I said, well, I'm giving a talk. And uh, he says, well, what's the name of the talk? And I went, all right. <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. And I said, well, the talk is called, I have nothing to declare but my genius. And uh, he asked, what's that about? And I said, well, yeah, it's based on a story uh, involving, at the beginning, Oscar Wilde coming through American customs. <laughs> and, said, and at that point, he said, well, you know, have a great trip. <laughs> Wave me through, and I thanked him for giving me a great story for the introduction to that talk. Uh, what the talk was about was um, the Mars Climate Ar Orbiter, which was a... How are we doing here? Not too bad. Um, it was a spacecraft that... Uh, I think you've all heard about this. This is the the famous example of the spacecraft that was lost because they didn't seem to know the difference between metric and uh, English system units for force, you know, pound feet and newtons. And uh, I was curious about this. And there was, there was a, a, a seminar the uh, semester before uh, Small Talk Solutions where I read the accident report. We were working with NASA people at the time, and I tried to find out what every, you know, had actually happened. And, you know, what I was hoping to discover was that it wasn't the tragedy that strong typing would have prevented, which is what a lot of people were fond of saying, you know. Whenever the strong type checkers would go to a conference, they would all cite the Mars Climate Orbiter as their poster child for why we should have, you know, a, a static polymorphic type system with nth order, whatever the heck they were calling it that week. And I was hoping that wasn't true, and it turns out it wasn't. Um, it, it turns out that uh, there was no way that the end-to-end -end error that was made in the communication between, um, between Colorado Springs, where Lockheed was, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, you know, the metric bastion in Pasadena, California, would have been capable of being resolved by um, a different language given the way that they were conveying the data. You would have needed an end-to-end -end type solution for data conveyance, which it would have kind of defeated the arguments of nine out of ten of the type theoreticians who would have argued that uh, that would have been the case. And that was kind of fascinating. And it, it fit with my bias. You know, what I, I like to be able to say is, um, do you feel safer with this or with this? Because the argument of the type guys was, 
if we can conclusively prove that no shot on goal will ever be possible, we can pull the goalie. You know, we don't even need to play the game. That's their approach to safety. You know, what I would prefer in dynamic languages, especially since I'm a guy who's been trying for you know most of his career to build languages out of dynamic objects, is tell a story about why this thing that's trying to have this assignment done knows that what we're doing is a bad idea. I would like to see the you know operational semantics of that object, that's a type, built into the language in a way where I can get my hands on it. And uh, so, as an argument for you know those kinds of architectures and for dynamic languages in general, that's where that tale went, and uh, you know, that's how that talk ended. And that's still kind of my my bias. So, where do we find ourselves these days? Um, why do I kill, you know, what's all this mean to the small talk community now? I mean, what are we doing with small talk? You know, wh why are any of us still here? You know, why are, wh what are we doing? Um, yeah, where is small talk winning? And, you know, w one place where it conceivably could was is, uh, in this space where we're lashing things together. You know, there was a, uh, uh, my first day talk, I talked about a, a pattern I've been sitting on for um, 20 years, since the ball of mud era, about glue code. And, and we told a story about um, how Mosaic, you know, arguably the most, uh, you know, impressive open source application, you know, maybe ever, um, foundation for Internet Explorer, for Netscape, and funda you know, fundamentally for Chrome was really something that was just lashed together you know, in really primitive C out of other existing components. And a whole lot of what programmers do right now is lash things together out of existing components. And you know, one of the things I was curious about is, you know, why, um, why are we so bad at this? You know, why has that turned out to be you know, so difficult for, for small talk people? And I'll come back to that in another slide. And then, you know, another place, I mean, forgive me for using the tritest, you know, uh, image in the history of the internet, but I, I think it kind of fits for what we're doing um, with the server side. You know, one of the things about small talk is, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a seaside application or a teapot application. You know, if you've got to build something on the server side, you've got a REST API, you're golden. You can work with whatever you want. I, I found myself a, a few weeks back realizing I needed a really, you know, brain-dead um, REST API, and I thought to myself, well, you're going to a small talk conference in a few weeks and you've always wanted to try this. So there you go. It's, um, I think that's what some of us are doing. But you know, here's the issue. We now live in a heterogeneous polyglot world, and um, there is a cornucopia of stuff out there written in every language you can possibly imagine. And there's a lot of language technologies that have gotten really good at, say, performing this role, being the glue code. You know, I'm stir divers who look for, if I can think of it, 20 people already did, I can go out and find it, and I customize it a little bit, and uh, you know, try to glue it together. It's, how do we get better at this? You know, how do we solve the problems that um, you know, kind of drove small talk people crazy 20 years ago, which is, Solve the utopian monoculture problem. You know that that seemed to be what happened with uh, you know small talk during the 90s. You know if you could live inside the image, you could do whatever you wanted. But we just didn't really, really. Okay, where are we here? It's, uh, did I get it? Yes, utopian monoculture. Yeah, play well with others. We got to we got to get better at that. You know if people can easily lash together things in Python, you know, that, that's one of our competitors. Um, why can't we get good at that? You know, and I, one of the things that's really gratifying, you know, I've, I've been, you know, I have a few years worth of unexcused absences from the small talk community to not put too fine a point on it. It would really be cool to hear some of the things people have been talking about this week help solve this problem of how we can be, you know, better at that. Because we're so good at doing so many other things, but yet we're not good at doing for ourselves you know, what um, we otherwise might have done. 
I feel a little bit like this guy, you know, Rip Van Winkle. He was a um, character in a novel by um, Washington Irving during the American Revolutionary War. And uh, he um, went out, maybe imbibed something or other from a jug that he didn't completely, you know, check the contents of and fell asleep for 18 years. You know, in some ways, getting back, you know, getting to come back to the um, small talk community after a bit of a, an absence makes me um, feel like that. Uh, I'm not completely sure how far some of these things are along, but it, it, it's good to, you know, to, to see that um, they're still moving. Um, I think we're, you know, I, I'd like to finish up as, with, with, with these kinds of thoughts. That idea, that idea of building objects out of objects, having this kernel of things that you can extend, I still think has incredible potential. It's just, why do we need, you know, what, what is it now? You know, every time you uh, wake up, there's another, another language translating to JavaScript. You know, there's yet another variation on, you know, a, 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 an untyped language or a language with type inference, you know, it's being built on top of the Java of ABM. You know, this idea that if you can think of a language facility, you can build it is still incredibly wonderful. But, in, you know, in order to solve that, you know, in order for us to be able to make that case, we've got to turn around and, uh, you know, be able to um, solve that, um, play well with, with, with others' problem. That said, you know, there, I've never had as much fun programming with, you know, any other language, with any other set of ideas than I have with, with, with Smalltalk over the years. And, you know, I know you guys have a choice uh, of programming languages, and um, you can, you know, you'll, you will use a lot of them in the course of your careers. But, you know, if some of you can move the ball down the field and get us to the point where, you know, some of these obstacles um, could be alleviated some, you know, pushing in the direction of, you know, just the sheer joy of being able to go into, you know, a code base and get something done, you know, t, you know, n to the one team, you know, 10 to the, um, you know, zeroth power by yourself, team size. I think that's the thing that made uh, functional programming so appealing for so, so many people, you know, I think they succeed in a lot of environments where there's maybe 3,000 lines of code, 1,000 lines of code, relatively small ones. It's rediscovering that thrill and the joy of being able to get something done. You know, I, I would, uh, you know, wish that for anyone. I would, uh, you know, wish we could export more of that. And I think solving the um, playing well with others problem would be something that would go a long way down the road towards towards doing that. And um, past that, you know, I feel like that guy, the prodigal son. Um, thanks so much, everybody here. You know, thanks to Ali and Federico and Gabby and, uh, you know, everybody involved with, um, with the conference for uh, bringing me back from uh, the small talk diaspora, be it uh, such as it is. It's been a treat to get to experience spring in Argentina, and I'm um, and so grateful for uh, the chance to take up three hours of your time, if I uh, count um, mini pop. And uh, we do, we have time for questions. Anyone curious about reflection? Yeah, there's somebody. At the mini plot, you said something about, uh, about uh, flowers having the advantage of being beautiful, and with that, they attracted the relationship with the pollinators. Mm -hmm. And I asked, about uh, why the thing that we believe is so beautiful has not been successful at attracting pollinators. Mm -hmm. And I think you 
said that you would say something about that on Friday. <laughs> yeah, I think I did. And <laughs> I think in some ways that... that no, I think it was the, uh, well, well, the pollinators are kind of trapped in a, uh, um, you know, a, a, an ecosphere where the propagation is limited by, you know, there, I, I guess there were a couple of things that, that, that happened to the small talk uh, folks during the 90s. One of them was, I think there, is, there were intellectual property issues that may have limited the dissemination of small talk in a way that uh, other languages now are not limited at all in being disseminated because of, you know, the cornucopia, the open source revolution. I mean, it's just, that was one of the things that I, basically, part of the, I, you, most, some of you aren't there. One of the things I was talking about, the, the, the patterns we were talking about on the first day, um, in part were recognition that, you know, we're kind of all like hip-hop guys. We're just sampling this cornucopia of things other people have already done. And unfortunately, you know, um, there are more severe limitations to incorporating things into small talk images you know, to this day uh, that were more severe uh, during the 90s than there, there might have been. So th that's what the utopian monoculture argument was about. I don't know if it got a, uh, across as clearly. You know, that and the IP. I mean, those, those are two things I can think of that may have, um, you know, limited the penetration at a crucial time. And, um, you know, vanquishing C++, you know, in the early 90s didn't look like it was going to be all that, you know, that wasn't going to be the heavy lift that Java turned into. And uh, in part because of the way that, uh, you know, Java didn't cost anything when they started disseminating it it wound up having uh, an advantage over small talk. The other thing was, um, well, its ecosystem grew very quickly. You know, it really did expand at a prodigious rate when it first came on, so there was that. But um, that's nonetheless important. I mean, I, I think what, you know, if we are, you know, the, the argument with, with, with pollinators is why, why does code need to be beautiful? This is something that's come out of the, the ball of mud stuff that we've talked about, uh, that Joe Yoder and I talked about for, geez, it's over 20 years now. Um, you know, bad code will run, you know, it's, uh, and a lot of code is really bad. Uh, not all code is, is really bad, but, you know, there are reasons why balls of mud survive. There's reasons why, why, why people build them. And, I've always thought we needed more of a justification than just we don't like it. You know, it, it's, uh, you can go on, you can basically make the Bob Martin argument that, you know, clean code is better than dirty code for a variety of reasons. I think Kent Beck makes those kinds of arguments as well, but I don't know if it's enough. It's, you know, from a code, from a, a, a code basis standpoint, you know, what is it you want to do? And if you're a code base, what you want to do is wind up being incorporated in lots of other code bases. And uh, there, there were some papers, there was a paper at Uppsala recently where they were looking at, um, you know, they were doing GitHub dumpster diving and looking at duplication. And they were finding, you know, in, in the JavaScript world, 90% um, of the files in the, you know, the universe of GitHub um, downloads that they did were duplicates. It's just astonishing levels of copy and paste. And, uh, so what's going on? And you know, the question you ask yourself is, if you're a piece of code, what have you got to do in order to you know, have programmers reuse you? Because that's the game. You know, nobody's going to write everything. You know, the, just the sheer volume of things that are out there that you can reuse is uh, you know, overwhelming, delightful, intimidating, everything. But that is the world we, we live in now. And, and the pollinator argument was, what's a piece of code got to do? It's either got to get smart enough, you know, to be able to, you know, move around from code base to code base. Like, uh, you know, what's a flower got to do if it wants to pollinate way over there? It's either got to evolve eyes and legs and limbs and, you know, intelligence, or it's simply got to attract something that has that already, you know. So if you're a piece of code, what attracts programmers? Readability, usability. You know, it's it, it's got to look like something that you want. So it really is the same evolutionary strategy that uh, flowers use to weasel their way out of having to involve e evolve intelligence and legs and wings and all those kinds of things. And uh, that I think so. You know, from from the code basis standpoint, that's a compelling argument for for beauty. And, uh, that's where that went. You know, took the liberty of summarizing it. But.